Good evening and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's good to have you uh, here this evening. Certainly welcome to everybody who's joining us this uh, session. Uh, we are here for the SADC Innovation and Investment Challenge Masterclass with Tommy Davies, uh, one of my favorite people in the world and one of the most special people in uh, on the continent. So without further ado, my name is Buisa Kavaka. I'm a part at Hyper Group and together with Finmark Trust, we are presenting this session this evening. So a hearty warm welcome to our ventures and our startups and our founders who are, who are part of this conversation. Uh, I know we're very excited to, to have some of the wisdom uh, that Tommy Davies brings to the table and brings to the fore uh, that our guys will learn from this evening. So thank you so much for taking the time to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's presented by the Finmark Trust and this particular program, this, uh, the SADC Innovation uh, and Investment Challenge is curated by Hyber Group. So tonight's session is gonna run in a very simplistic order. We're gonna have Tommy Davies, who I'll introduce shortly, um, delivering a masterclass for our, for our for ventures. And throughout the session, you um, are welcome to comment from, you could be joining us on Facebook, on YouTube. Please use those platforms to share with us your thoughts, your comments, um, and I'm sure he'll be happy to receive them. So um, if we can um, have uh, Tommy on the screen as well, Pierre, so we can begin to start. I want to look at him, he, this beautiful human being, this wonderful man um, who is, uh, you know, a father figure, brother, you, you know, everything to me is everything. So, um, you know, Tommy, it's good to see you in good health. It's good to see you um you know with uh just yeah when i see you i just my whole spirit lifts so let me quickly um formally read um tommy's bio i mean those of you who know tommy um will know that um tommy is really the inspiration for all of us uh in the ecosystem he's the godfather of angel investing um in africa having founded the uh, um the lagos angels and having been a key uh, kind of catalyst for the founding of the african business angels network and his founding president and again, after so many years, he finally has a job. Well done, TD. <laughs> <laughs> he is today the Chief Investment Officer at Green Tech Capital Venture Partners, uh, where again, we know that he's going to do amazing things for the benefit of the continent. And again, to add, he forms, uh, he's really on part of a lot of the, uh, the global influencing angel investment communities, whether it's a global business angels network, whether it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a global, basically on a global scale when it comes to angel investing in Africa, uh, whether it's a, it's a diaspora community that's investing in Africa, Tommy has been a pioneer. Um, I've had the personal pleasure of traveling with him uh, to various uh, parts of the continent, uh, launching and activating new angel investor communities, uh, but bringing hope to many ecosystem builders across the continent who are doing this pretty much a thankless job, eh, Tommy, pretty much a, um, but again, a very important and critical intervention. So TV, as you know, uh, you, you inspire us at Hyber. You're also part of our global advisory uh, community. So one of the things we did with our ventures last week, we spoke about the importance of having advisors. And we certainly very blessed at Hyber to have you. Um, I certainly um, have valued um, the many conversations we've had in some exotic and fun places across the continent. So with that said, Welcome, TD. <laughs> thank you, thank you for, for being here with us and thank you for just being open and willing to share your knowledge with us. But before we go to TD, um, Pierre, I want to kind of bring on our wonderful sponsor and partner, um, Dumisani Dube um, uh, from the Finmark Trust. Uh, Dumi, welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Vu. Uh, and, uh, so, Dubi, I want to give the platform for you to kind of say some, you know, uh, words of thanks and appreciation and acknowledgement before we hand the, 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 the full platform over to TD to, to go into his masterclass with us. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much, Vu, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis, for making this time to uh, share your amazing wisdom with us. Um, and uh, really, it's a pleasure to be with you this uh, evening virtually uh, for the SADC Innovation and Investment Challenge Incubation uh, Program Masterclass. And uh, just as a way of introduction, Finmark Trust 
is an independent non-profit uh, trust uh, whose purpose is making financial markets work for the poor by promoting financial inclusion and regional financial integration. And uh, really the reason why we are doing this uh, for the SADC Innovation Challenge is that we believe the future of financial services in Africa is data-driven. And uh, the people who are currently outside the financial system or poorly served by it can be brought in simply because we have data about them and the ability to analyze the data and develop relevant solutions. And I'm actually happy to let you know that the four startups that uh, are in this program have amazing uh, solutions that are anchored on evidence-based insights. And this journey really is designed to accelerate them to, to market and also access the much needed investment for their business. So really, thank you very much, uh, a Hyber Group, uh, Vu and your team for supporting this uh, incubation program. And once again, to Mr. Davis for making this time uh, out of your busy schedule to engage with these amazing startup companies so that they can uh, have uh, better insights in how they can access uh, funding and uh, anchor their business uh, to uh, uh, be investment worthy. So from my end, that's all. Uh, we're looking forward to I mean, a great session. Thank you. Vu. Can hear me um, again welcome to our ventures tommy we're very honored to have you and the ventures as well i mean we've got four amazing young founders and i know how you love founders <laughs> we have four very amazing young founders um, who have been part of the process and part of the program um, we've got two from tanzania uh, we've got life plus as well as perma agri um, we also have two from botswana we have digital diamond and money chaps uh, and you know four very amazing dynamic young founders so again if here if at any point you you want to kind of put them on screen um you know we can show the world who these young guys are and throughout the session and even later on we'll give them an opportunity in which to engage with with tommy what we've done with these sessions that we've allowed them not only just these four ventures tommy to benefit from this from your wisdom but we also have enabled uh, the broader community of uh, of um, finmark trust to also benefit from this so Again, we potentially have founders from Lesotho, Malawi, Zambia, you know, uh, wherever throughout the SADC region um, where Finmark Trust operates for those young founders also to, to come. And why are they here? It's because you are talking about a very important subject that I know is also equally close to your heart, is that is how to build an investment worthy startup. You have been a long time investor. I mean, I know uh, one of your first forays has become a, a global success story <laughs> in many respects, and hopefully many more will come, um, the super strikers. Um, again, I don't know, do you wanna maybe give that context around your, your experience around before you get into your, your core notes? <laughs> what do you want me to say? Um, uh, super strikers was started by a friend of mine who, uh, when I was in the UK as head of uh, IT research for Marks and Spencer, building MNS's first website, we met. And he returned to Cape Town uh, after Mandela came in, uh, just like I returned to Nigeria because of Asonjo had come in. And I got a call saying, we're starting this uh, comic. Um, and we'd like you in because we believe Nigeria is one of the places we'd like to distribute it. Uh, how much do you need? Uh, he told me, and I was more than happy to say, yeah, you got my support, uh, but we're going to need to change one or two things. At that time, I didn't even know that's what angel investors did or that's what it was called. I just did what I thought was natural. We managed to revamp it, change it a bit. And, um, well, to cut the long story short, um, Earlier this year, Super Strikers was purchased, was bought by Disney. So, um, but be in between that, Media24 had a take of it. They yeah. took over 50% of it in 2008, which was a partial exit for us. And then last year um, was when it finally went. Yeah. With, um, with <laughs> Moonbug. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody just understands what we're dealing with so that they don't have to wonder but you know why are they having this old man on screen? Who is? What does he know? You know how we are in Africa. <laughs> ah, okay. <But> I just... <laughs> well, 
Uh, I, I, I want to state thought, it straight. Uh, it, that, that's easy to do. Uh, my name is Toby Davis. Uh, I'll explain myself as I go along. So thank you, Tommy. I'm also looking forward to listening. So I'm going to come off now to also just absorb the, the, the wisdom and, and the thoughts around how you, as uh, Africa's number one super angel, um, advise companies to get ready for investment in the investment journey. Um, enjoy okay. the session, everybody. Thank you, everybody. What I'm going to do now is uh, share my screen uh, with you so that... Um, we can have we can have this conversation. Okay, he says share, and I am hoping that you can see my screen. If the technology works as it should, um. Can I just get some feedback that everybody can see my screen? Vu? Hmm. So, PD, I think um, we'll as assist you with, uh, with uh, if we can. Um, if you've got the share screen on there, uh, Pierre should yes, be able to pick it up. Can you see my screen? Uh, he's asked you to pick up the right application. So you just need to pick up which which tab you want the, the application to go uh that's exactly what i thought i had done let me stop sharing and start all over again pleasure okay so if i share say share screen because uh funny thing is we tried this earlier and it worked <laughs> so <laughs> you'll all just have to excuse us uh i've been having those kind of tech can you see it now no it's coming. Oh, it's coming. There we go. There you go. We're ready. Ah, oh, it works. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. My name is Tommy Davis. Everybody calls me TD. And I am an advocate of the African early stage entrepreneurship ecosystem. I'm an angel investor uh, with a growing portfolio of early stage ventures. Not all of them make it. Those in brackets, as you can see, haven't done as well. And no longer exist. The latest investment being True Flutter, which is an app that actually brings single people uh, together. I am a co-founder of the Lagos Angel Network in Lagos, Nigeria. I'm president of the African Business Angel Network, or as uh, Vu said earlier, founding president. Um, and um, unfortunately, just uh, last week, I resigned as a board member of the World Business Angel forum but i am still a member of the global business angel network um today we're first of all going to look at a bit for some definitions my consideration of what an ideal founder looks like and why it starts with a vision then we'll talk about what makes startups unique i.e that growth the funding and the exits and and we'll talk a bit uh, more about that striker story that uh, vu was trying to get me to tell earlier on then we'll look at my mentor, David Eshes Rose's um, startup investment portfolio theory, which I think is very, very important. Everybody thought it only applied in America, but in my experience of well over 10 years now of investing in startups, I've found that it does apply. We'll look at the different investment stages um, that startups go through. And within that context, we'll then look at my poem framework uh, which talks about why a vision is brought to life through the proposition and the organization uh, that are measured by the economics over milestones in time. And uh, finally, we'll look at the startup scorecard, which is how I assess and measure uh, startups. And of course, it's not worth it without giving you a case study of how that is used. So if everybody's okay uh, with that, let's go. So first, some definitions. What's an angel investor? Um, I think because that's what I just claim to be. Well, actually, it's somebody who's investing personal capital um, in uh, startups. And what's personal capital? Well, it's time, mentoring, and advising. It's connections, 
to your business network, and most importantly to, to startups is also putting in a little bit of cash. But like I say to most of my, in fact, all my startups now, time of, of an experienced angel is worth its weight in gold. And typically we're seeing increasingly that uh, angel investors are partnering with innovation hubs that are incubators, accelerators, and even make spaces. So what's an innovation hub? Well, I like to call it a fun place to be where imagination meets execution. Of course, as all things wonderful, start. Um, and that is really where startups come to life. Um, as ABAN, for example, we partner with Afri Labs, and um, that has uh, yielded some very, very amazing things. But not to be left out of early stage ecosystem, we've got venture capital, who are the people that are actually providing funding at more advanced stages uh, to early stage uh, startups. And the difference being they actually aggregate money from what are called limited partners. And they as general partners then invest just like angels do, you know, looking over your shoulder to make sure you're doing the right thing and helping you along as you create that value for those customers and clients um, that you're targeting. So with that, with those definitions, let's look at, you know, when we talk about founder, 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 what's an ideal founder? Well, to me, an ideal founder is an executioner. What do I mean by that? somebody that gets things done. It's that simple. That is the ideal founder. But let's dig a bit deeper. We're talking of a visionary person, somebody that's got an idea of this is what the world should look like at some point in the future. Okay. And they've got a great perspective of this is what it's going to take to bring this vision to life. Okay. It's where I'm going to have to do this in the first three years and then five years from now, this is what's got to happen. And then maybe in about 10 years, we should be there. And then I'm seeing, okay, in about 15, 20 years, when the world has changed this way, we should be able to do. It's that kind of visionary person we are talking about in the first instance. The second is they have to be passionate. This is somebody who is leading from the front, leading by example, being the change they want to be. They know how to run an organization. They know what makes people tick. They know how to put teams together to get things done. They know how to separate people in terms of competencies and capabilities so that they can marshal how these teams actually arrive at the destination they're supposed to be going to. We're talking of a manager who has that organization structure down pat in their head, day one. Okay, you're going to start with two people, but you're going to grow to 200 people. Can you see how those 200 are born from the two? That's what we're talking about in terms of management. We're talking of an executive that knows I've got to have a board of directors or I've got to have a senior leadership team or I've got to have advisors. And this is where they fit in. I don't need that an advice for that because I've got that capacity, but I don't know anything about ABC. So I better get an advisor here. Um, this is what the board should be, should look like. And this is how my shareholding structure wants to be having that corporate governance understanding. Okay. And finally, but most importantly, somebody who has the emotional intelligence to set themselves realistic challenges and achieve it. So those are the capabilities I'm constantly on the lookout for in individuals when they say they're a founder CEO. I hope that helps in terms of your perspective of getting why you are the way you are because you tick all these boxes. I'm hoping you do. If you don't, then there's a little bit of work to be done. Now, I did say it starts with a vision. What do I mean by it starts with a vision? Well, to start anything long-term, you've got to have a compelling vision. That's what is going to keep you up day and night. Every time you wake up, you've got another hiccup, you've got a problem, you've got a challenge. You are seeing that future. That future that you're explaining to people, this is how we're going to get here. This is where we are going. We're talking of a measurement of, the, of your startup is how fast and how far you get with your vision. And it's that journey, okay, of successfully bringing your startup to life. That's really what people like myself 
are looking to support you in. That's what hubs are for. That's what everybody's looking to do is, damn, this guy's got an awesome vision. We've just got to help them bring it to life. We've got to help them make it happen. So because that's what we're all focused on is we want to realize the commercial potential of that vision. We've got to look at two fundamental things. The first is, what exactly is it? Well, what's the product service offer? How, you know, that's making money. What's the problem being solved? You've heard that all the time. What's the solution? Who's the customer? How is all of that coming together in an offering to the market? That's the first critical thing. Well, you, know, you, you may talk of functions, you may talk of features, you may talk of pricing, you can talk of a whole bunch of things, but what exactly is that product service offer? So that's the first thing, and I want you to remember that. The second thing is, okay, that's nice. I can see it. How do you deliver that in such a way that the value is actually delivered to the customers? In terms of what I call dot P, delivering on the promise you have made by the proposition. And that's why it starts with the vision. Now, a bit about startups, because um, I often get the question, and if you follow me on Twitter, you know, I've raised this point, uh, is an SME a startup? And can a startup become an SME or an SME become a startup? What's the difference between a traditional business and a startup? Well, the first thing is, built for rapid growth in extreme uncertainty, all right? Startups about, are about innovators, typically use providing technology-enabled solutions, okay? So they're bringing these things to market relatively quickly. Ideally, they're addressing unaddressed markets. Previously, unaddressed markets, they're providing niche that didn't exist before, but they are doing something fundamentally different, innovative, and they're building fast. It's that speed of growth that we are is the first differentiator of a startup. But that's not all. They also differ because a startup will come to people like me and pitch me and say, oh, we're trying to raise 100K or 150K or maybe even 250K. Uh, can you help us? And you have these people that will help. And finally, the concept of exits. But let me dig a bit deeper, just because of the audience we have today, I thought it's well worth drilling down a bit. So first, what do we mean by growth? All right, well, from where I sit, if you're not doing 10 to 20% month on month growth, uh, you're probably not a startup, okay? And I'm talking of between MVP and PMF, okay? MVP is your minimum viable product, Okay, and PMF is when you found product market fit. You should be seeing that growth if you've done the right things before you launched. And there's a whole different conversation we can have about that. But it is that fast growth rate. And I'm talking top line revenue. I'm talking people, a whole bunch of KPIs, whatever it is you measure, it's rapid growth. That's sort of the first key thing. Second is funding. We all know. Um, 2019 guess what? Over $2 billion came in chasing startup funders. And well, uh, Toby Shafshank says 1.34. We've been corrected. We found, you know, according to my organization, Green Tech, we can actually lay out where that money went and where it came from. But the important thing is funding is readily available for startups who show that kind of growth that I was talking about. And the third and final thing is this, before you start, before an Indian investor or a venture capital gives you money, the first thing they're asking is, how do I get my money back? AKA, how do I exit? Well, I thought I'd tell a story. You heard a bit of it earlier. In 2001, I put $5,000 into Strike Entertainment. And as I said, in 2008, Media 24 came calling. And my friend says, oh, we want to take half your shares to make up the 51%. Um, will you do this? And it was like, sure, why not? You know, uh, when the check came, I thought it was a mistake. You do the math. But guess what? The story didn't end there. Last year, all of it went. And again, that check came. That's what angel investing is all about. That's why 
Angels look for, in my case, my next super strikers. And by the way, as I said earlier, it became a Disney property, and uh, I don't know how many X that would have been. So there you go. You can't win them all. But that's what makes startups different, okay? It's the fact that they've got rapid growth. They can get funding to get them to exits. So I did say my, my dear friend and mentor is David S. Rose. He is the founder of the New York Angels, and he wrote a book called Angel Investing. And in Angel Investing, he talks about the startup investment portfolio that has the five startup truths, okay? And like I said earlier, in my experience, guess what? I found it to be true. You'll probably see what I mean in a second. First of all, most startups fail. The reason they fail, we can talk about, but the reality is, guess what? Whether we like it or not, most startups do fail. You saw those in parentheses in my portfolio when I presented myself earlier. Well, those are failed startups. So that's sort of the first truth in the startup investment portfolio theory. The second is, I don't care who you are. No one knows which startup is not going to fail. I don't. Okay. And I do my darned best and I will talk about scrutiny. You just heard what what I look for in founders, I even go beyond that, but nobody knows which startup is not going to fail. And the best example I use is my investment in a company in Nigeria called Pass.ng. Amazing company. Um, I helped them get on the networks. They were going gangbusters. I get a call one day in London, sir, Sam has passed away. 26 year old lead founder just didn't wake up. And that startup, surprise, surprise, failed. So you really never know which startup is not going to fail. Now, the third is you can start to see where David's going with this. Investing in startups is a numbers game. You can't invest in one startup and then just say, that's it. You're not an investor. You need a portfolio. Why? Because most startups fail and no one knows which startups are not going to fail. So it makes logical sense that you've got to invest in a whole bunch of startups if you really want to get the kind of returns we brag about because you're not going to get a striker every time. Right. If I don't talk about this later, remind me, okay, when we do the Q&A, but what ends up usually went down first. And I'll, I'll sort of shed more light on that particular statement uh, later in my talk. And finally, finally, as... We all see with the likes of Uber and others, all startups always need more money. The minute they stop needing more money, they no longer start up, they become a grown up. So I hope that helps you understand what David's startup investment portfolio theory is all about and why we stand by them. Right, I did say that I would talk about what went up usually goes down first. And these are the startup investment stages you see. And as you look at it, can you see what we call the startup valley of death? It is where most startups end up failing because they can't raise the money or the customers don't like their product or some reason or the other. And it is when they are turning that curve from going down coming up, starting to go up, that's when angel investors like to place their bets. There are other people, as you can see, from bootstrap financing to crowdfunding, all the way through to corporate VCs, mergers and acquisition that impact the life of a startup. But for us, and from where I sit, that's where angel investors work, is where they pick you up just at that seed stage and try and get you to growth. Now, what are the investment focuses? Because that's really what you guys want to know. Well, actually, there isn't a set formula, okay? The number of investors, the amount you raise, the time between rounds, the number of rounds, it's going to vary from startup to startup. You know, you can't say because Flutterwave did it this way, Paystack has to do it that way. They are all different. And there are a whole bunch of factors, all right? South Africa is different to Nigeria, which is different to Kenya, which is different to Egypt, okay? 
Um, if you are in energy, you're totally different to somebody in logistics and transportation, who's different to somebody in meditech, and that's totally different to agritech. These guys got angel in funding, these guys, angel investment funding, these guys went straight to VC, these guys lived on friends and family, you know. And regardless of that, as I showed you, generally there are five stages startups pass through as they raise capital. The first is the pre-seed and the ideation stage, okay, before you're making any money. And at that time, our bets are on the founding team. You don't have a product, you don't have anything to sell, you have a great idea, you've written it down, you've got all kinds of things going on, but really anybody giving you money, they're betting on that team. And that the emphasis being on team, not the individual. If you don't have a team, eh, people like me tend to be a bit leery, okay? Uh, the most money I've lost have been on single founders, but more on that later. Seed stage, it's the fact that you've got a product or service and we're starting, remember I talked about that high growth rate. Seed stage investors are looking for that. What's the growth rate? Top line revenue, give me month on month. What are you doing? Okay, what's your burn rate like? How much runway do you have left? That's the focus at seed stage is what is that product service offer that is, and what is that target market? Are they big enough? Are they absorbing this enough? Do they like it? Those are the key considerations when taking that bet. By the time at your growth rate, it's looking at traction, okay? How's, how are you doing against competition? What exactly is happening to your new product features? Do you have an established customer base that is growing, okay, in the use of your product? Those are the critical things being looked at at, at growth. By the time at scaling, which is really beyond my competence, um, I am told that unity economics is really, really the focus. And of course, by the time you're getting to the later stages, it's all about valuation and your ability from your operations to really contribute to valuation. So that's where investment focus is on startups. I hope you found that useful. I am expecting a whole bunch of questions during the Q&A time, which I'm hoping uh, I can run through and get, get to um, very, very soon. Now, in terms of stages I, I did talk through you need to understand where you are and why is that because when you look at my poem framework which says simply for every vision you have a proposition that has been delivered by an organization and the measurements are how the economics work over time in terms of milestones what does that mean let's let's break it down well for proposition it's actually what's the value okay what is the value you are offering to customers? We look at things like your target markets, the segments, the customers. We look at the product uh, service development. You know, we look at the functions and the features of the product itself. And of course, we look at the world's favorite radio station, WIIFM. For those of you who don't know, that's the radio station everybody in the world listens to. Yeah, really. Actually, it means what's in it for me. That's how customers look at you. And that is what is aggregated to demands. It's based on the benefits they get based on the pricing you're offering them. So what's the competition like? What are alternatives? What kind of substitutes and differentiations? The list goes on. But here's the rub of it, okay? At ideation stage, when you're just starting out, I expect to see a clearly defined concept that articulates that vision. By the time you're getting to stage two as a startup, I'm expecting to see that, yes, there are customers who actually you have an established offer with. By the time you're a growth, of course, we were trying to see, are you increasing your market share? It's not just about revenue. It's about that revenue growth. By the time you're at scale, of course, you're looking at new products, you're looking at new markets. Why? Because you're an established venture. At late pre-stage, all better off and anything. So that's really what we're looking at at the proposition. When we look at the organization, it is about the ability to deliver that value proposition I just described to the customers. So of course, when you're at the ideation stage, we're looking at you have a team that will follow you. Do you have a business model? What kind of people are you looking at? What kind of processes are you using and what kind of technology is supporting you for a delivery structure by the time you're a startup at, at growth i said it earlier it's about traction 
okay? Do you have at scale repeatable processes that are well documented so it's not, oh, it's X, it's uh, John that does that and it's David that does that, but anybody can be hired and they still get the same quality. By the time you're at late stage, it's about market leadership for the venture capitals. And those are the two critical components that make up any investment worthy startup, as far as I am concerned. But that's all well and good. How do you measure that? Well, it's about economics. It is about, I call it, show me the money. Okay. It is the financial measurement of how you are creating that value. That's what we're talking about here. So, what do we look at? Well, I ask the question of every single one of my, did your dad give you money? Did your uncle give you money? Have your family and friends actually put money in this venture? Because if the people that are closest to you, even if all they can put is a dollar, don't trust you enough to put that investment in, why should I? By the time you're getting to a startup where you're having a steady burn rate, at that time, grant prizes, angel money, it's, it's, it's free flow. And this is where Africa has gone gangbusters. We're seeing all kinds of money coming in at this stage for startups. The place is really awash. By the time you're in growth, you're heading for break even, where just about what you're spending is what you're making or even more. But at scale, you're unit profitable. And at that time, you're looking at VC type funding. Late stage is private equity, yeah, probably self funded. So, what does that mean? It means from a milestone expectation standpoint, that at seed stage, you're targeting your minimum viable product so that you can get some market acceptance. It means that as a startup, you're looking for product market fit in terms of customer acquisition stability. It means that at growth, you're looking at how to sustainable, sustainably manage your growth. And then, of course, by the time you're at scale, the new markets and the new products that are going to keep your company driving its way home. And of course, by the time you want to exit, all of us love a significant valuation. So how do we assess these things? Well, I've developed a framework called the POEM framework. It's a systematic collection of different information to test if you're investment ready. You've seen what some of those are, okay? We look at the vision, we look at the status, we look at practices, we look at all kinds of things um, based on like I said, the proposition organization economics and the milestones. And there are certain expectations we, we aim to see given whatever stage you are. So how does it work? Well, for the proposition, we take a look at, does it, do you have a strong product service line? Do you have a unique competitive advantage? Do you have positive market growth? And for those, we give a score. Then we look at your organization. And of course, is there an entrepreneurial vision? Remember, it starts with the vision? And then do you have inbuilt the ability to execute as a team and as an organization? And then do you have the right access to resources, be they the board of directors or the board of advisors or other resources? And then based on that, there's a score given. Then we look at the economics for financial returns. Do you have satisfactory revenue strengths? Is there credible future profitability? Do I believe your forecasts that you're going to make money? And finally, are the cash needs you have acceptable? Based on that, again, we give a store. And then finally, we look at the milestones in terms of what's the exit potential here? Remember, I've got to get my money back if I give it to you. Whether I get it back in five years or seven years, I've still got to get it back. So what am I looking for? Do you have some good exit routes? Okay. Is there feasible follow-on investment? Remember, I'm very early stage. I'm angel. I'm looking, will the VCs buy into this? Uh, and finally, will they, when they buy in, give a satisfactory exit value? And again, give a score for that. Now, I know I've run through it, but here's what it looks like when it's all done. This is one we were uh, a company we looked at in October of last year. And you can see their scores there and what the value means. And you can see that their poem score is a 69% which is an indication that, yes, we probably want to invest. And if we invest in this particular startup, we've got to work with them on their exit routes, on their product service offering, and also on follow-on investment. Now, I said I did want to get through it quickly. I hope I have done it justice. I'd really, really like to thank you.
uh, for listening. Your feedback is important. Get in touch. But right now, I'd like to open it up for questions, um, if I may. Thanks, GD. As always, I think, um, you know, very insightful. And luckily, luckily, a lot of the ventures have had the opportunity to go through uh, your poem uh, framework, so they're quite familiar with it. In fact, what I want to do is give our ventures the first real shot at uh, at engaging and, 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 and putting up your questions. And in doing so, what I also want you to do is review and listen to how they, they present it. So um, as, as um, the founders of the ventures, as you come on, please make sure that TD also understands your elevator value proposition pitch. Uh, so don't make it too long, no longer than one minute, um, so that he can also get a contextual background of what disruption you have. The common theme that all our ventures have in common, they're all in FinTech, but they're doing various different verticals in the context of how um, they bring, they're building their solutions across the continent. So okay. of the ventures, um, I want to see uh, who's ready to, to ask your questions and uh, to engage you first. Um, should we maybe go through uh, alphabetical order um, up here? So we start with Digital Diamond, Mtabisi, uh, if Mtabisi is on. Okay. William has a question. Um, Tabisi, we'll start with you. We'll, we'll, we'll do it alphabetically, guys. I know you all have questions, I have no doubt. So we want to yes. give each of you an opportunity to engage uh, with TD. So Mtabisi, please introduce yourself to Tommy. Tommy, meet Mtabisi from Digital uh, Natives and Digital Diamond. But give us your one minute uh, elevator and then shoot with your question. Yeah, um, just like you said, thank you for having me on the show. Um, Digital Diamond is an instant identification app that also doubles as a centralized base for payment systems like your FNBs, your mobile monies, your investors. It groups them to your identity, basically. Um, it basically works by you giving your information, your KYC information, and it generates a unique ID that's going to be used to uh, make purchases, to access uh, services, financial institutes, instead of having to come with your certified copies, physical paperwork, and all that stuff. It digitalizes all that in the form of a digital ID as well as linking your uh, bank accounts to the, that same ID or payment systems like mobile wallets. Okay. So uh, what I just heard is you essentially, you tokenize identification information. Yes, basically. Okay. Yeah. And then with the tokenized identification, it allows you to make purchases. So you go to a point of sale, for example, you verbalize it, they type it into the point of sale, it sends an OTP to your phone, and then you can select what payment, like FNB card, Stanbic, um, any mobile money, and just select that and it makes a payment and we make a cut from that as well. So from all the different mobile wallets, all the different uh, banking cards, yeah. Okay. Um, my, my immediate you know, uh, question to this would be, what do people, what will people require to be able to tokenize their ID. Oh, so, so basically what are certificates, yeah. mother's maiden name, blood type, what 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 are what are, what's required? <laughs> so generally right now it's it's it keeps building. So the system is not static. As the more you engage with the various institutions, with the partnerships that we have, since it's like a mutually beneficial partnership with us and them, the, when they inter engage, the more information that they feed it, their system, the more it will gain. So from knowing your last name, first name, address. Okay, so, next so it's, a cumulative, it's, a, it's, cumul it's a cumulative Always. identifier. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. At what stage are you in now? Um, we are in, I would believe startup, based on what you had mentioned, we're at the startup stage, we're just before growth. Um, we've gotten a prize money, for example, for the static challenge. Litejo last week we also won. So Litejo is like a loan, uh, loan insurer, micro lender. Uh, they also we won uh, second place there. We won first place here. Uh, and um, I, I hear that. No disrespect. I'm more interested in understanding customer traction. So what are you doing in terms of customer growth month on month? How's that going? Okay, so the MVP we're basically working on the security uh, aspects of it. We were just we just like paused it because we had to rework some security factors around it. Um, the servers that we were using are perfectly fine. We're just making sure that when we do go scale, there is no security issues at all. 
So we have not had any security breaches at all so far. So we just want to prevent that from happening in the future by just testing that out right now. Yet? No, 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 no. We don't have any customers right now, but we have oh. interested parties like uh, the okay. largest so telco. You're, and you're still in ideation. Yeah, you're still in ideation. Then until you've All got right. your first customer, you don't qualify as a startup in my books. Okay. Okay. So work on that. Get your MVP out, and let's know how you get on. What are your questions for me? Um, my questions were basically around. Uh, certain partnerships, because we recently heard in Botswana, for example, they're trying to do a, a digital ID, which is just your Uman card, your first name, last name, the general um, card. Uh, doesn't necessarily have augmented, like I said, cumulative <coughs> ID. It's, it's stack, static to who you are. And we're trying to, this may be out of your jurisdiction, but we're trying to find out the best way to approach them uh, in terms of partnering with them, like what aspects of what uh, strategies we could use um, is your, over is and above. Your IP, like, is your IP protected? Sorry? Is your IP yes, it is. protected? Okay. Yes. Because um, that's that's the first, first thing around the partnerships is to be sure that you're securing yourself before you extend to others. Um, so the, the answer is um, just knock on the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just a little bit of red tape, but do I, have I do. A board I, of I, advisors? I, no, no. Currently, we don't have a board of advisors, but we do have mentors. Okay. Well, you you probably want to network to them through your mentors or your advisors who are senior enough to understand how to structure a partnership on your behalf. All right. Okay. Yeah. No, that, that was like the main question. That's the main focus and uh, okay. sticky point Thank right now. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. I'm conscious of no the problem. time, so um, yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Tavisi. So you see, Chief, listen, this man can move mountains. He's giving you advice. So to all the founders, remember, listen and receive, uh, and again, so that you can take away uh, the insights and then apply them to your business as you as you digest and begin to start processing how it applies. Without holding up too much time, I want to offer the opportunity to William, the CEO uh, of Life Plus. In Tanzania, Tomidi. Um, okay. So, William, um, remember one minute uh, to shoot uh, to give us your value proposition and the context of your business, and then shoot with your question. Go ahead, William. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I think I met Mr. TD back in 2007 during the Sahara Park uh, here in Dar es Salaam. Uh, probably, maybe you know, he's a very busy person. He wouldn't remember me. But we are, we are Life Pluses, uh, and Life Plus is a telemedicine provider here in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. We work with healthcare providers uh, as well as individual doctors uh, to facilitate uh, select health services through our mobile and uh, web platforms. So what we have uh, is a mobile uh, and web platform that integrates virtual physician consultation, uh, hospital appointment booking, uh, uh, as well as um, uh, 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 a mobile wallet uh, uh, to facilitate uh, convenient and instant services to, to patients uh, uh, here in Dar es Salaam. So uh, at the moment, we work with um, about, we've uh, been able to acquire more than 31 doctors uh, that are uh, on board on the, on the Life Plus platform. And uh, mm -hmm. we're partnered with more than um, uh, five different hospitals in Dar es Salaam, in India, as well as South Africa, uh, on the or on the on the mobile application. So, in a very nutshell, that is that is Life Plus. That is what we do. And uh, we had a little bit of a very rough age with compliances here in the country, considering. Um, uh, you know, we do not have a regula regulatory framework around you know digital solutions in healthcare particularly you know in the space of telemedicine so it has taken us rather a very longer route because the government is you know a little bit skeptical you know think uh, to uh, you know having to do with uh, security of the data you know um, privacy and 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 stuff like that so we've been working with them to improve day by day and uh, and I thank god we're here where we we are today 
Uh, so that is a little bit about, about life plan, yes. And your question? Um, okay, so I have a, a set of two questions, but I also do like, I would also like to hear from you. Uh, you did speak to Digital Diamonds as well, you know, give them feedback and, you know, want to know a little bit about them. So I'm going to ask probably maybe to hear from you as well about our company. But uh, um, I, 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 I'm going to, uh, I, I, under self-disclosure, have you ever heard of Helium Health? Yes, I've heard of Helium Health from Nigeria. Okay, yes. they're one of mine. So, yeah, you want to All look right. them up. They're, they're, they're in this, they're doing something similar to you. Wow, wow, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So All take right, a look so, at Helium Health. It's a Nigerian team that's uh, operating Pan-African. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Go I ahead. heard they're, they're planning to expand to Kenya. Yeah. All right. So my first question would be, uh, actually, we, we, we had a very long discussion with my team yesterday because currently we have uh, an offer on our table uh, from uh, uh, an investor. And uh, what I really wanted to know is because, you know, I've sat down with a, with a couple of founders here in Dar es Salaam, and what I found out is that, and with experience that I've gotten myself as well. So uh, these early stage investors, or rather VCs that are active in, uh, in, 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 in the investing arena here in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking the likes of Big Stars, Green Tech Capital, uh, Y Combinator, uh, and uh, yes, <laughs> yes, these, these are the one the VCs that we currently that are currently very active. So the model that I actually see them take, you know, in investing in early stage startups is that they are gonna uh, they are gonna invest in a startup and then require a very small equity from that company, hence giving that company a very big valuation. I would, I, I I usually like to term it. Uh, a crazy valuation. Uh, for instance, we we had a similar contract last year with Seed Seed Stars. Uh, uh, it was a safe agreement, um, uh, uh, and then uh, the valuation cap that they were giving us is above six hundred thousand US dollars. Well, you know we know well and good that we are not worth a lot of that money. So a lot of startups then struggle, you know, to raise you know, to find the next investor in terms of, you know, because the next investor will come along and say, look here, you know, uh, you have a crazy valuation and, you know, I'm not ready, I'm not ready to pay more because that's the setup that the first investor is setting up so that the, the next, in, I mean, so that the next investor, investor that comes along, uh, you know, kinds of takes it, takes it or, uh, or pays more. So I would like to, I would like to understand from your perspective or from your understanding and experience how what is the ideal way or methodology to evaluate a company that will not give it a, a very big crazy valuation which would later cause them to struggle to find the next investor but also not find a very small valuation that is somehow you know going to put them to be vulnerable so that the next investor doesn't come and eat, eat them up completely because we've also seen that uh, here in tanzania Okay. Um, while I can't explain all of them uh, in such a short place, I want you to look up the following. Look up the mm -hmm. Berkus method, B-E-R-K-U-S. Look up okay. the scorecard, the scorecard valuation method. That's the angel's favorite. Everybody uses it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then look at the venture capital valuation method, which is a right. sort of destination based. Uh, there are others um, like uh, risk factor summation method, but there are a whole host of different. And what I tell angel investors is use about three or four different methods to get an average valuation. And really valuations are only as good as what people will accept. It's, it's, it's a negotiated value. It's not, there's no, it must be this way. And it is dependent on the environment you find yourself Tanzania mm -hmm. is a bit more restrictive in terms of its commercial environment than others. Mm -hmm. That would factor mm -hmm. in, and I would expect to see 
valuations in Tanzania, in fact, lower, for example, than a similar startup that was in Kenya or South Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but so you that, know, that, that, would, uh, that, that would be my, my, um, my recommendation to you is study the different valuation methods um, and therefore arrive at um, arrive at um, a, a uh, arrive at the correct you know at something that you can live with. Please excuse me one second. Hello. Okay. okay I, so, I'm actually... <laughs> so so again, look, congratulations by the way. So that's that's our our session is tomorrow. So while TD clears up on that side, we'll we'll show. Uh, we surely kind of check in with you, with him. Uh, there he's coming back now. So okay, yeah. <laughs> Pierre, you can take me off again. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I have a six o'clock. I've had to move. I may just need to get up for a few seconds uh, to to let them in. But uh, it's it's my grandsons, so I don't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, right. so that 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 is what I would say is, you know, at least that way you're an informed, and you can then have the conversation with the investor to say, I've used all these methods. This is what I think our valuation is, and then they can share with you how they've arrived at any valuation they're suggesting. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I'll certainly have to look these methodologies as you uh, recommended them. Uh, uh, and uh, Vu also promised me to have this conversation on the one-on-one -on -one tomorrow, so that will be very, very useful. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you very much for your for your for your insight. Am I, Vu, am I allowed to shoot a second question? Because I've I've I have another question for for Mr. TD here. While you're waiting, you better ask it. Oh. Exactly. Right. I was gonna say, so, <laughs> man, you gotta be sharp, dude. <laughs> Come on. All right. So my my second question would be, do you have an experience of investing in startups uh, that are typically in idea stage using other methodologies uh, that are not, um, you know, traction based? Uh, of course, we see that a lot of times in you know in in Silicon Valley where somebody just looks understand. at the market potential hello can you hear me i don't understand that question yes i'm saying do you do you have an experience of investing in startups based on other factors like the market value uh the competition uh base but this this startup is typically in idea stage they don't have a product yet they don't have a customer i used to do ideation yet. i don't any i i used to 10 15 years ago, I used to do ideation. I don't do ideation mm -hmm. anymore. I do post revenue now. When I was doing ideation, there were typically maybe 100 or 200 startups available a year. Now we're about mm -hmm. five, 10,000 a year, and I've moved on. Please excuse me. Vu, can you drop me down while the next person comes on? I'll be right back. No problem. All right. So, again, um, uh, William, I think that the reality of what's happened in the ecosystem over the last 10 years. Is that it's evolved mm. in its in its construct, right? So mm -hmm. the, the the context around quality has is shifted. Mm. So are, are some mm -hmm. of us who've been um, in ecosystem across the continent are uh, familiar with a mm. time when the, the main conversation, main talking points was the lack of mm. investable uh, opportunities. We're no longer mm. in that time. That's why I think more most importantly for a lot of founders, um, it is mm -hmm. about the advisors that you bring around you. It is about the opportunity networks that you create in each in which you, you are able to define the kind of traction you need um, to, 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 to leverage off, to speak about the growth potential of your company. Africa, as a, just as a simple mm. kind of context, has zero patient capital. There is, there's a term in the, in the angel investing space um, called patient capital, very popular in markets in more evolved advanced markets like Israel or the, like the U.S., where um, angel mm -hmm. investors are, are literally able to come in um, at early stages and able to work with you through the various phases of your of your growth mm -hmm. and development. In Africa, we all have our revenue. The reason why this is primarily is that part of the, the re reality in our continent is that, you know, there's a trade-off in investment. Because we don't have mm -hmm. as many uh, exits of success, 
By the way, there's not many people like Tommy in, on the continent who've seen the full growth cycle of exit from start to finish uh, over a set mm. period of time. We're still yeah. very much in the early stages of that. So what again, what a lot of people are doing when they begin to start shaping their investment portfolios, they're looking at the opportunity cost of investing in stocks or investing in real estate. Okay. Okay. So okay. if if your if your company cannot showcase a return on investment opportunity that measures mm. up to that kind of they call it a hockey stick growth uh, potential, mm. um, you know, yeah. very few investors, the pool of investors becomes smaller and smaller. So the more successful you are in building up your traction and building up your your revenue line and being kind of in a position where you can speak to investors about accelerating your growth the likelihood of raising seed and investment stage capital is is diminished smaller and smaller and smaller okay okay so okay. so it's just kind of like be 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 conscious of that and uh, and again um you know be mindful that investors are looking for opportunities to grow with fast growing companies uh, because there are mm -hmm. trade-offs and opportunity costs that you have to consider. Okay, so thanks for your question. Yeah. I'm gonna move along yeah. to Tabiso now. Um, Tabiso is from TD. Tabiso is from Botswana as well. He's from a company okay. called Money Money Chaps, <laughs> um, and he can tell you a little bit more about um, uh, the work that they're doing at Money Chaps. Uh, he's very much the youngest of our ventures, uh, but I'll leave it to him to again, Tabiso. You've got one minute. Uh, to kind of give the context of your value proposition and then shoot with your question. Okay, <clears throat> my name is Tabiso Mabaka and um, I'm the so the, the founder of Money Chaps. Uh, Money Chaps is a money ma a money management tool, um, and our vision at Money Chaps is to eliminate blind spots through uh, financial education and empowerment. So what we well, what we do at Money Chaps is to first educate um, people about finances, about their finances, and then we empower them with the necessary tools to manage their finances. And through that, then we can build a, a community um, that can be, that can, where, where we build data that can be used uh, for value-added products with uh, financial service providers. And also we want to be um, like a data source for alternative credit scoring. So um, our business, yeah, so, Yes, we, 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 want to, we want to be a data source for that because there, there has to be data. Data has to come from somewhere for it to be uh, analyzed or for there to be artificial intelligence. There needs to be a source. So we are trying to give people a, a platform through which they can be enrolled and then given the tools to be able to have uh, some activity that can now be analyzed in the, in the future for like the historic data can be used for, for scoring. So our business model... Um, uh, for the end consumer, we we are we are not charging anything. We are just giving it for free. Uh, but we are looking to use that data to be able to collaborate and partner with uh, financial financial uh, institutions and uh, other uh, players in the in the industry. Okay. So so my question to you is um. You know, I've I've had a challenge. Uh, in uh, sorry, I've got to introduce somebody to you. Okay. This is the person that was at the door. That's my okay. grandson. <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> hey, I, I've, hello. I've seen those pictures on WhatsApp as well. I've seen yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, the other, that's the brother. <laughs> and he's being held up by his uncle, my son. <laughs> oh, big old oh, guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a, uh, yeah, as I was saying, mm -hmm. yeah, as I was saying, uh, because we are, you know, most most uh, most startups that I've seen that offer financial tools like invoicing, profit and loss uh, man management, uh, offering group finances management tools, they offer it on a subscription basis. But we want mm -hmm. to offer it uh, free, uh, you know, with the vision that. When uh, the financial institutions, uh, when we when we can we can use the, the because when it's free, it's 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 likely to get numbers in terms of the, the people that use the app. Yeah. Not not necessarily. Okay, you yes, need to be yes, careful yes. of that because yeah. people are becoming people are starting to understand the value of their personal data. 
Okay. 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 So you need you need yes. to be conscious of that fact. Okay, uh, and that is increasingly happening across the world, where people are starting to understand that their data has value. They use how they use their mobile phones, what they use it for, and everything else is is increasingly being understood. And those who set to take on due advantage of that will fail. So it's something you just need to make sure you have the right systems in place to reward people for providing their data. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I was I, I wanted to ask because yeah, because um when when you have an indirect model, the mm -hmm. the value comes at the at a later stage, you know. When you are like me, you are still trying you are still in the ideation stage probably will develop and then we would launch but in the first first like the first few months you are still saying we are, we are still building up that value which is the the community and the data so mm -hmm. how do you package your 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 pitch or your the way you approach uh, potential partners or potential donors or investors uh well the, the first is that remember what i said earlier about vision yeah that's what you're selling. That's what you've got yeah. to sell, okay, is the end game, okay? Because what you are looking for are people who are going to join you on the journey and they're going to be with you for a while. So you can imagine yes. if, if you want to marry a, a new wife, not that I'm suggesting you should have multiple, but if you're going to marry somebody, you don't on the first day, you know, you, you've got to share with her so she knows this man is going to be able to look after my children because that's how she's thinking. And it's the same way an investor will think. This guy is going to be able to deliver my returns. So children, okay, for an investor are returns. Do you get the analogy? Yes, 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 yes. yes. You, you, you get the similarity, exactly. So it's the same thought yeah. process. It's the same way you would approach it, okay? And that's why transparency is very important. That's why honesty and integrity are very important. Because those are the first things people look for in long-term relationships. Does okay. that help? Yes, yes, it helps because we we as not like quite the saying, answer you were expecting. Yeah, yes. Uh, let, let me just make it more 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 practical. Let me give you a practical example. For example, mm -hmm. uh, there, there 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 are people who offer alternative credit scoring. Okay, and mm -hmm. we are saying we can we can be a data source because it has to come from different sources. So that it's uh, it's more it's it's more well detailed, like well informed. Mm -hmm. So if 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 I want to partner the, with them now, when I still don't have I feel, I still have like hundred users. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you. That, it's the uh, same thing. Uh, That's yeah, exactly yeah. what I'm saying. You are going yeah. to remember remember the story of um of uh, the guys that turned down Zuckerberg at the beginning. Yeah. Exactly. And don't forget, there was a time Google tried to sell itself to Yahoo. OK, so you, you've just got to have the mindset that your vision, if you believe in your vision, then you are looking for people who will buy into your vision. And if they don't, that's their problem, not yours. OK, do you get you've got to believe yeah. in yourself. That's the beginning. That's why I said it starts with the vision. OK. And you may look at it and say, maybe I'm not sharing the vision properly, in which case you look at your messaging. Am I, am I saying the right things to them? Because if you're trying to, you know, it, it, it's, um, okay, let me put it this way. You can't get there from here, but you can always get here from there. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you try and plan out the future, it's the most difficult thing. All you're going to see is COVID-19. Okay? No, seriously. Yes, yes. That's, that's all you're yeah. going to see is COVID-19, COVID-19. But if you say, well, you know what? Imagine in 2025, A, B, C, D happened. For that to happen, that means in 2024, this would have happened. And in 2023, this would have happened, which means in 2022, 2021. And then you come back to today. Okay. You've got to start from the future in your case. Don't 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 try and convince them about your hundred customers now. Okay? Yeah. Try and convince them about what they would be missing. Okay, if five years from now they hadn't they don't join you now. Because 10 years from now, I'm gonna these are the things in my vision. That's why I need you on board. 
that's how you sell your story. I hope that helps. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, TD. So well done, Tabiso. And again, please take the advice, apply it, and then see, digest, see how it applies uh, to your to your path. And again, uh, implement and apply. We've got one uh, more please, venture, TD. Please, please, Go please. Uh, you saw my slides to all the startups I've spoken to. Um, I live on Twitter. All right. DM me. I have an open DM. Let me know how you're getting on. If you have additional questions, um, as long as you don't mind my tweeting the answer to the world, please, please, you know, go ahead, ask. I think they heard you loud and clear, TD. So our last cool. founder is also from Tanzania. Um, they Again, they, they're in the fintech space, but with an agri angle. It's Donald mm -hmm. from Firma Agri. Again, uh, welcome, Donald. Um, good to have you. So as I said earlier, one minute kind of a value proposition pitch and then shoot your question uh, to TD. Go ahead. Thank you. Boo. Nice meeting you, TD. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, my name is Donald. Like you both said, you're big. Up the volume. Anyway, um, volume is low. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, much uh, better. Okay. Um, my name is Donald. I'm the head of operations at Firma Agri. We are an agriculture uh, investment platform whereby we try to digitize the structuring of uh, different agriculture value chains here in Tanzania. Uh, we currently um, just launched uh, a couple months ago. So we would say we're a startup because we, we already did the uh, uh, MVP. Um, we, um, I would say we started with the poultry value chain here in Tanzania and we're trying to, trying to find a model whereby we can scale into different value chains in different areas or different countries here in Africa. Um, one of the main questions I would want to ask is we've seen um, different startups um, in, in different countries. We've seen different startups in, in different countries whereby they'll get funding before even having a business model. Now, I wanted to know if it's something that you have ever tried um, in terms of like um, financing a startup before realizing a revenue or even a business model. And um, what is the latest... Um, the, the closest of a startup you've ever funded before actually realizing that model, if you've ever even done that. Yeah, well, your volume's gone down again. What, what I'm hearing is, do I work with ideation stage startups? Is that a fair, that is startups well, that, that don't have customers yet? Not, 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 oh yeah, definitely customers, yeah. Okay. Customers. Okay. Um, well, the answer is yes, I used to. Um, if you look at, I told you the story of Striker. It, you know, it was just an idea at the time. Um, when I invested in uh, Sproxil, um, which is a pharmacovigilance product, it was an idea um, at the time. Um, but given my experiences with um, my my inability to assess what is a good mo business model or not, um, I gave up on that. So um, what I do now is I only invest in those who have customers, uh, albeit a few, but at least that means they've got something and then we can start to shape it using the lean, uh, lean machine startup methodology to actually test our way to what I call revenue, uh, revenue streams. But um, it, it's, it's a tough one nowadays because there's so, so many ideas out there. It's, it's just untrue. In, in my case, on average, I'm getting propositioned maybe uh, 30, 40 different pitch decks a week I'm now seeing. Um, so from that standpoint, you, you have to put certain things in place. And that's what, uh, unfortunately, I've been forced to do because I've only got so much money to invest anyway. Also, um, just to add on on that one, we've seen uh, some startups that have traction, they have users, but they've just not realized exactly their business model or revenue. Would we, would we still call them um, uh, in ideation? No. If, if, you've got, if you've got customers, okay, 
Then we start to look at things like customer acquisition costs, customer drop-off rates, if, if it's a term to buy, et cetera. So there are different things you're going to look at, and that's why I shared the different stages and what we look at in each of those stages uh, with you. Because what I'm looking at, if, for example, um, somebody is has an MVP, the activities I expect to see are activities that would take them to what we call product market fit. And if they're not conducting those activities and I'm not seeing those KPIs come to life, then they're doing something wrong. Okay. As opposed to if it was a growth, you know, a growth startup that's past PMF, then the, the, the focus is going to be on what kind of processes are yielding the results and how much automation they can put into their systems so that that's, they start to prepare themselves to scale. Because if you cannot, there's no way you can scale the way we talk about scale without having elements of automation in. So it's a stage dependent assessment. I trust that helps. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, well, I thank you all for listening. For listening. I Thanks, hope that Denise, was worth so again. it. Well, well, it's absolutely worth it. So I've got one more question that's come out of YouTube for you okay. um, that uh, has popped up. So, so Pierre will, will, will pop up the question now. Uh, but the question comes from someone in Ghana. So we have okay. a whole bunch of people across the continent listening. Um, this one is from a gentleman. I don't know if it's a lady or gentleman by the name of Flace. Uh, is it a good idea to go into funding when an MVP is still under development for a platform company? Um, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, the, the, the answer is it depends. Okay. Why do I say that? Uh, it depends on if you really need the money. Um, not everybody has enough money to build an MVP. Uh, it depends on also who the funding is coming from and whether they're bringing anything besides funding. If they're only bringing cash, my, my gut reaction is, nah, you, you, at that stage, you don't want cash only because what they're going to be taking, the chunk of equity they'll be taking out if it's an equity play or what they'll be requiring in terms of returns if it's a debt play, uh, it, it, it can be a tough, tough decision. That, that would be my take. Um, but on the other hand, if the funding is coming from friends and family or if they're coming from angels that know your industry not just any angel okay angels that know your industry and therefore can see your vision then it may not be a bad idea to do but outside of those parameters it's it it can be you know i've seen some horror stories around those things where um, I don't believe in any anybody outside the owners owning majority share, but you see those things change dramatically because of moves like mm. that. I trust that helps. Yeah, I'm sure it does. So thank you for your question. Thank you to everybody who's tuned in to these sessions across the continent. You will have seen the details of how you too can join the community for the SADC Innovation Investment Challenge uh, as well. But I, it would be unjust for me, TD, to let you go without giving you an opportunity to 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 give some glory to the family that you've now joined at Green Tech, <laughs> and even maybe the family of ABAD because you've got uh, we've got November coming up. So mm -hmm. maybe just quickly tell us um, anything interesting that we should be aware of as a community around Green Tech. We certainly would be inviting Green Tech to be participating with us in our demo day uh, on the twenty fifth okay. of February in twenty twenty one. But anything Fantastic. right now that these companies need to be aware of around green tech specifically as a, as a fund as a funder well um watch this space uh because what we are doing at green tech is we've we're actually taking in all that has happened during covid and pre-covid and we're looking at um a an investment model that combines our classical uh, results for equity venture building model with different forms of funding. 
So you can imagine with my, my role as president of the Africa Business Angel Network with about 50 networks uh, across 33 countries, um, mm. the idea of de-risked startup investments is what we're looking at. And uh, that brings me to the fact that if you are an investor in African startups, then you don't want to miss ACES 2020, which is the 3rd and 4th of November. Put it in your diary, ping me if you don't have the details. And we're looking forward uh, on the first day, uh, we're gonna look at seed stage. And then uh, the following day, we're gonna look at VC territory. So both on early stage and very, very amazing speakers. Um, I'm not gonna tell you who they are just about yet, um, but all of that is uh, going to be released during the month of October as we start to prompt and prep people uh, to join us. I hope that helps. Um, and thank you very much again for listening. So absolutely. So as we wrap, I want to personally thank you for your time. You know, you know, you don't have to do this. I mean, I know you don't do this all the time. So I still want to acknowledge and thank. Uh, yeah, my I mean, peeps. Yeah. yeah, my peeps. <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, ooh, uh, and I'm so <laughs> any day. Any day. And look, for those of you who don't know, when Vu says jump, I just say how high. <laughs> So we're so super uh, grateful. I know the companies have learned a great deal from you. We will continue to, to engage with you as we move forward in the program. This is only the beginning stages of what we ultimately are doing. And I think you get the sense of where we're going with it. Yeah. Like I said, also the demo day is gonna be the 25th of February, 2021. So yeah. technically we have pretty much a long time, but I know what you've experienced with these companies today is gonna be something totally, totally different with what you're likely to experience with them as we move forward in the program. So I can't thank you. As for me, it was important that we start with you. I mean, for me, it would have been a miss if I started with anybody else uh, on the continent. So um, just getting the right blessing uh, from uh, uh, the father figure and the, and the true um, kind of uh, godfather of the angel investing community is one kind of blessing that we, we can appreciate. So thank you so much, Didi. I know I'm embarrassing you, but I, I need I it from, the, from my heart. Uh, no worries. I look forward to hearing, <laughs> I look forward to hearing each of these startups poem stories as we go along. Absolutely, and we're working on that. So we, we started that process and we'll share that with you. Um, okay. Again, if you wanna tune in to our next session, do join us again on, the, on Thursday, the 15th of October, where we'll be joined by the CEO um, of uh, of uh, box uh, commerce, uh, Mr. Craig McLeod, who's got a long-standing um, um, background in uh, uh, delivering and presenting tech. Um, so that will be the public session, and our ventures will also have a bigger opportunity to engage and meet uh, with with uh, with Craig on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So thank you in advance to Craig uh, and his team for agreeing to do this. And I know that you guys are gonna you're gonna learn a lot. We have comments coming through all the way from YouTube, from Facebook. Um, all the way. So again, TD, we have everybody watching and I know we're going to have this recording uh, because to me, this is also an important kind of uh, um, uh, context around what we're talking about here. So I can't thank you enough for your time. Thanks to your family for allowing you, as you know, that I always do that as well. So um, allowing us to, to join, please do um, uh, pass on um, the fact that we really appreciate what they do for you keeping you safe during this time as well um, of lockdown. And, um, you know, we all kind of are grateful to have you and totally honored to, to be in your presence. So thank, thank you, you to everybody at, at both the ventures, um, the ventures and program. Thank you to our partners at FMT uh, for, for trusting us with this. And we absolutely look forward to continuing the journey with everybody. With that in mind, thank you so much and good night, everybody. <laughs>